quite interesting that um, a few of the speakers, or most of the speakers today, have spoken about social media. We really can't, you know, uh, it's something that we can't do without. It's part of our day-to-day -day lives. And, um, you know, with the advent of selfies, you know, you have um, people taking pictures. You have people taking pictures, selfies, and of course, we all know that, you know, after like 20, you get the one or two that you get to post. Um, you know, people get to monitor the likes, you know. Um, it's, it's just something that is really taking over. And I guess why people are so concerned about, you know, people liking their picture and putting their best foot forward is because of their looks. They're like, okay, yeah, I want to take pictures of myself looking really beautiful. Sometimes I meet certain people and they don't look anywhere like their picture. Weddings in Africa is huge. And um, in Nigeria, there's this growing trend of makeup artists. They have different techniques, different styles. They, you know, uh, they have the skin toning, they have the nose contouring, they have so many other things that, you know, and then they put those pictures up. And then, then again, people start to like them. The, what struck me the most, besides everybody looking the same, is that the women were looking more foreign. You know, and I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. You know, but I thought, what could be responsible for that? It's one of those things that you really don't pay attention to, but it's there and it has its impact. My name is Taufik Okoya. I'm a husband. I'm a father of two beautiful children, and um, ordinarily I'm an entrepreneur. I have over 20 years' experience, and um, I got married in my uh, early 30s. I was rather late, I mean, considering African standards. But I played catch up, because within the first year, I welcomed my daughter. Um, I remember at the, being at the hospital, looking at her, very small, cute, innocent, peaceful. I looked at her and I saw her future, conquering the world, doing great things. And she was even yet to utter her first words. And as a father, you know, the first father, the first time father, these babies don't come with manuals. So I thought, you know, at that point in time, I, I had a resolution within myself that I'm going to do everything possible to be her provider, to be her anchor, to be her protector, you know? And at that point in time, I thought, yeah, you know what? I'm loving the feeling, I think I will have six. By the time I welcomed my son, that idea was quickly quenched. <laughs> <laughs> because I realized the emotional commitment that is required to bring up a child. And, you know, it's something that we sometimes take for granted, but during the developmental stage of the children, it's you that they get to look at. It's you that begins to form you know, who, uh, who they are or who they might end up being in future. After um, there was a Sunday, quiet Sunday like that at home, we were watching TV. I, as a father, like to provide the best for my children in terms of you know, the toys they need, things that I thought would be good for them. So I ended up buying a lot of, you know, Disney toys, characters. My daughter was very fond of the Disney characters, especially. So one Sunday like that, we're at home watching TV. And she asked me, she said, Daddy, what color am I? Yeah. <laughs> It's th that question stopped me right in my track. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. It was a moment that seemed like an eternity. And I'm thinking, wow. If I wonder why, because it's rather an obvious question and rather simple. But for me, that was a sign, an earlier sign, a first sign of an identity crisis. Just like me, she knew the answer to the question she asked me. But I did my best to answer the question. And um, after I did that, I don't think she believed me, but she said, I wish I was white. 
that totally broke my heart. And I thought, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? I mean, really? I mean, I'm the protector, I'm the provider, I'm her anchor. Where, where did I go wrong? But um, I told her, you're beautiful, you're black. I mean, like God created different people. You know, we have the different race and, you know, so we're just one of the other race. We're not white, we're black, we're beautiful. I told her the advantages of being uh, black. But um, I'm not sure she was totally, like, convinced. She just said, well, okay. That discussion that day took me back to three months earlier when I'd gone into the store to shop, uh, get a gift for my cousin. She was turning seven. It's that age where um, you, I, I believe as a child, she's beginning to discover herself, identify herself. So I wanted to get her something that was going to be instrumental towards her development as a child. And I got into the store and all I saw were white dolls. Cindy, Lucy, Jenny, so I was like, and none of them really had fulfilled that desire of the kind of gift I wanted to get her. And at that point in time, I thought, well, it would be great if there was a black doll, you know, that way, at least she'll be able to identify herself and with the hope that it would improve her, you know, um, her self-confidence. So, but it was an idea. I got the gift, I left the store, I totally forgot about it. So when that issue happened with my daughter, I looked around, and indeed, with my own hands and money, I had bought her all white dolls. It was something that never occurred to me. I never thought anything of it. So I thought, OK, there lies, in, there in lies the problem. I will work on creating these dolls, because I had the idea. I know they're not available. So it took a year to design and um, develop and produce the dolls. I was rather excited. I was very happy I'd done something really great. But I got such heavy resistance from the stores. They weren't going to sell them. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, oh, bring us white dolls. They sell better. I'm like, these are African. These are Nigerian dolls. They're black. They're like, our customers want white dolls. I'm like, that, that totally threw me off. So what I did was to embark on like a educational sort of campaign when, where I went on, TV, on you know, various TV programs, you know, talking about the importance and the psychological effect that you know, kids playing with dolls in their likeness would have on them, on their psyche, on their person. I went um, on the radio. I was in the papers talking about the, and some people were thinking, what are you talking about? You know, some people thought I was crazy. And someone was saying that, why are you a man, a grown man like you, making dolls? <laughs> I had to explain to someone that, you know what? One of the people that fought for abolition of the slave trade were not black. So really, I don't have to be a woman, I don't have to be a girl to create this. There's a need, there's a deeper sense behind what I'm doing. After, uh, the, <clears throat> after a year, we, got, we started getting good, um, we started getting acceptance. And with the acceptance came criticism. And so that's when people started saying, oh, they're not black enough. Oh, they're too thin. Oh, they don't have, all have kinky big afros. And that started, um, I got some questions in my head when they started saying all that. I mean, I understood the basis of some of this criticism. But at the same time, the questions that came to my mind were, who is truly an African? We're all Africans. But what defines us as Africans? What does it take to be identified as an African? What are the beauty standards for an African woman or an African in general? Are Africans ugly? These are questions because I don't have answers to those questions because it varies, it's wide. One of the great things about being an African that I know is the diversity that we have. More questions still came to mind. 
To what extreme will people go to be classified as beautiful? We spoke earlier about how some people, just a you know, conservative number, taking 20 selfies before they find one to post. 20 is conservative, wouldn't you say? Because <laughs> I know some people that do much more. Why are Ferris Kington considered more attractive? Why are they considered more attractive? Why is silky long hair such a hit amongst African women? Is black truly considered beautiful? Or is this something that we say? Like someone said, um, I think it was from a movie, when they said, uh, beauty is really from within. And they said, that's what the ugly people say to, con to console themselves. <laughs> is looking white more acceptable? If so, to whom? These were questions that came up while working on this project, based on the feedback, based on interactions I've had with people. And the, 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 the drive for acceptance seems to be leading us somewhere. We might not be in control of where it's leading us, but you find that it might be the norm, and you find a whole lot of people having to do it. When people go on the flip side of that, it is usually such, it's usually in such an extreme that also baffles me. I'm not sure if any of you know or heard the story about um, Rachel. Rachel is a white woman that believes she's black and, you know, started acting out being black. Her hair, her tans and everything. And she got called out, not in a very nice way. The backlash of her action was severe. She was ridiculed, she was embarrassed. I don't know why. There is also Mallory, a simple 12-year-old girl that thought rocking braids, which is, you know, identified amongst Africans. She got such a bad lash that I think maybe a parent or her parent had to put out an apology. Why? Because she had braids. The whole, the, the, most of the people that were complaining were Africans. They felt insulted. They felt she had no place. And it went on for so long that they had to pull down the picture and put up an apology. Why I'm baffled and why I'm confused is that African women do this all the time. So is it OK for African women to do the silky long hair, bleach their skin, look white, and it's acceptable? And then you have a white person that tries to be black, and it's a problem. Why do black people feel, when white people try to be black, that they're being ridiculed? That's why I ask the other, the other questions that, is black really beautiful? I mean, because if someone tried to copy me, copy me or dress like me, I'll be rather honored. I'll be rather impressed. I mean, it's an ego booster. So it's really misplaced. And I really don't get why black people get upset when white people try to be black. But meanwhile, it's OK for us to do so. And guess what? The white people have no problem with us trying to look white. <laughs> they sure don't. That's because I believe that's because they're comfortable. And it's all right for the, us if you want to look like them. But for us, it's not OK. We feel ridiculed when, we try, when they try to look like us. The black skin is absolutely beautiful. It has you know, um, great advantages. You know, um, the melanin in our skin helps fight, you know, the free radicals. Um, it's, you know, in terms of that, you hear the saying so much that black don't crack, and so on. And this is the same melanin that is destroyed in the bid to be fair. I've heard all sorts. Um, apparently, there's a new crave or craze, uh, Moroccan or something, 
uh, which I think is mixed with some shampoo or whatever. And people spent a whole lot of money on this product. Not even the hair. Some women walk into a room and the hair on their head, which is not theirs, is about 120,000 at least. Well, they have some fakes, so. <laughs> so that's where you hear real 100% human hair. <laughs> it is something that I believe has to be understood. Because if we truly embrace our black skin, we should not, we should rather feel honored that some people try to be black. But I think that black people take offense simply for the fact that we have not come to embrace and accept it. We have no choice. Well, some people think they have a choice, but we have no choice. There's so many things associated with the black skin. This was, this is a picture from the Clark experiment that was done in 1940, or in the 1940s, of um, a child being given two dolls, a black and a white doll. <clears throat> they asked questions like, which is the bad doll? Which is the um, doll that is not good? All the negative, all the positive um, negative things, the children pointed to the black doll. All the positive things, the children pointed to the white doll. The last question was, and which doll represents you? It was a moment of confusion for the children because they've accepted that the black doll, you know, with all the negativity about the black doll, and this is a doll that represents them. So you find them looking and not really being able to point to the black doll, but when they finally do, very reluctantly, there's so much negativity sometimes associated with the black skin. Maybe that's why sometimes they don't embrace it. What we should do is begin to really, truly be honest with ourselves. Understand the true beauty of an African. We're Africans not just because of our skin. We're descendants of kings, great, great kings and queens. Africans have such attitudes sometimes that you wonder where from. Nigerians are considered one of the most happiest people in the world with all the problems and lack of money that is, <laughs> that, you know, is in society. But as a Nigerians, you can always tell a Nigerian anywhere. We are very, um, we're very noticeable, sometimes a bit too noticeable. We're very intelligent. That's why, you know, I think in the 80s, you know, a whole lot of banking system had to be changed in Europe because, you know, we just always found a way around it. <laughs> and we're thinking, oh, this is rather easy. There are so many other things that identify us as who we are that we can be happy and proud of. While working on this project, I did some children's books, and I went online looking to find women that did great things of old. I didn't find very much. On Queen Amina, I found two paragraphs. And the two paragraphs simply said, uh, she was a warrior, she never was married, she killed her spouses, and named um, Zaria after her sister. She did much more than that. We don't have the history. We don't have the understanding of where we are from. You go to China, you find that, you know, Chinese people hold their culture dear. The Indians hold their culture dear. And wherever they are, they are Indians, they are Chinese, they are Japanese, they, they hold true to their culture. With us, we lose ours. And the young generation now are fast losing track of uh, you know, of our history. When my daughter was in school, in, um, in primary school, uh, she came back, her assignment, history assignment, was to go onto the in internet and find out about um, Guy Fox. I'm like, what's this Guy Fox got to do with anything? There's so many other people that you can learn about. Guy Fox? So we really need to begin to appreciate our history, our culture, and I think that would begin to make us proud Africans. But what, what I now do with my project, because it really just started with, with trying to fill in a gap. But I realized working on this project that there's more than a gap. 
that needs to be filled. All of my goal is to make sure, well, doing my best to make sure that all African girls around the world learn about being an African and in turn be proud of their skin color, of who they are. After this, your perspective on beauty, on who you are, are you, how you are as an African, the next time you do say black is beautiful or you're proud to be an African, please make sure you mean it. Thank you.